Did JWST disprove the Big Bang? What is the purpose of the solar system? And how big of a star do you need to get a black hole? All this and more in this week's question show. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the question show. Your questions, my answers. Now, as always, wherever you are across my channel, if a question pops into your brain, just write it down. I will gather them up and I will answer them here. Now, we also record this show live every Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. So this question show that you're watching is the result of a live show where people came and hung out and asked me a bunch of questions and I answered a bunch of questions and it was a good time and you definitely want to be a part of that. So there should be a notification for the next time this is going to happen. Uh, subscribe, click the notification bell, put a post-it note on your fridge and uh, that way you won't forget to come back here Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. All right, let's get into the questions. Matthew Serum, why this is still boggling the mind is because you keep holding on to the Big Bang Theory, which is wrong. James Webb proved it. I don't know what happened, but in the last couple of days, one of our older videos got picked up by the algorithm and now we are getting a lot of views on it. And all of the comments are some version of this comment, which is you scientists lol. Big Bang, ha ha, dummies. Uh, and then they'll make some kind of assertion. Usually, like they have their own personal theory. And like in some cases, I'll get it, you know, they'll want to send it to me in the form of a book or some kind of paper that they've already published. And like, I am not the person to send your theories to because I am not capable of analyzing whether or not you're correct. I am not a scientist. I'm not a cosmologist. The people to talk to are the cosmologists. But my guess is you've tried that and the cosmologists have ignored you or told you that they're not going to consider your theory. And the reason for that is because the way that scientists communicate with each other is via science journals. Uh, so they will do a piece of research working with the James Webb Space Telescope. They will uh, publish that paper on starting with a pre-press like archive, but then they're, they're really hoping to get their paper into the journal Nature, into the Journal of astrophysics, all these different journals. And that is the process. That is the way that scientists talk to each other is through journals. And so if you want to have your ideas taken seriously by the scientific community, you have to get your work published in a journal. And there are hurdles that people have to jump through to be able to get their work published in journals. And it's designed to, uh, you know, with peer review, having various um, hurdles that people will have to overcome to get to that point. And, you know, like the, the reality is this process has evolved over hundreds of years where scientists needed some way to be able to filter what are the ideas that have the potential of being correct and which are the ones that don't have any kind of understanding or underpinning that sort of helps them understand whether or not they should spend their time because scientists have a limited amount of time. They should be researching and they should be keeping up to date with the literature. And so this is the trap. And there's some great, you know, I've done some great uh, interviews. I think one of my favorite books out there is by someone named Durant Lewis. And we actually I did an interview with Durant about this. And we just talk about like scientists, astronomers would love, deeply love to be proven wrong about the Big Bang cosmology. It's incomplete. They know it. There's something else there and they don't know what that is yet. And they would dearly love somebody to bring them the correct answer. But there are many separate lines of evidence that support the current theory of the Big Bang. And any new theory has to both explain those current lines of evidence and make testable predictions that people then can go out and and prove and ideally like it it explains some of the ongoing mysteries like dark matter, dark energy, 
why there's more matter than antimatter in the universe and so on. And it's a really difficult um, hurdle to overcome. And for some reason, like, I'm not sure why, but people, they want to take on the biggest theories. They want to take on Einstein and, and they want to take on the Big Bang, but they don't want to pay their dues. They don't want to go to a university where the, the current theories are taught. Like in many cases, it's someone in a different field. Maybe they're an engineer or maybe they work in electronics or maybe they're a medical doctor or maybe they're just a entrepreneur and they have ideas and they want somebody to listen to their ideas and and unfortunately this is how the system works so like i said you know james webb did not prove that the big bang is incorrect and what it found is that there are galaxies that seem bigger and more mature than anyone ever anticipated when they took their theories about how quickly matter should come together, how quickly stars should form, how quickly black holes should form and accrete material around them and how dark matter should be able to concentrate matter into smaller areas to form these galaxies. They took the best understanding, the best theories that they had at the time, and they ran models of what we should expect to see in the universe. And the structures that are being seen right now at the very limits, like just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang, are bigger in some cases than anyone had expected. And that's exciting because it gives you constraints. It gives you some ideas and says, okay, these methods of accumulating matter, of bringing galaxies together, of star formation are more likely than these other methods. But when you look at the like the foundations of the Big Bang, like when we look in all directions, we see galaxies moving away from us. When we look out to the farthest that we can possibly see, we see the cosmic microwave background radiation, which perfectly matches the time when the universe became transparent and was able to let out radiation into the universe. When we measure the amounts of hydrogen to helium in the universe, we find that the ratios exactly match a universe where it was so dense at one point that the entire universe was acting like a star for like 10 minutes. And all of this hydrogen was being fused into helium, but then it expanded to a point that this process stopped perfectly. And so any new theory that comes up has to go, okay, here's why all of those galaxies are moving away from us. Here's why the cosmic microwave background radiation is in this exact temperature that we see. And here's why we see these abundances of hydrogen to helium in the universe. And that's just like the three major pieces of evidence. There are like another dozen independent lines of evidence that confirm the Big Bang theory. And so when someone says that the James Webb Space Telescope has disproved the Big Bang, what I hear is I have a theory for how the universe works and it is going to overturn Einstein. It's going to overturn the Big Bang. I like it better, but I haven't done the work to be able to replicate the results of the existing astronomers. I haven't taken the time to get a formal education in cosmology and astrophysics to be able to publish papers in journals in a way that astronomers are going to be able to take this seriously. I want to shortcut the process and get publicity. And I want to uh, try and convince news journalists to publish my theory. And I guess some do. I mean, when you look at what happened with when James Webb first saw these big galaxies, then you did see a lot of stories out there, but I'm not going to do it. I'm going to wait until I see a lot of evidence from the scientific community consensus, and then I'm going to um, report on it. And that's like, the, that's how I've got to work. And so, you know, like, I understand that it's frustrating for people who've come up with an idea. Um, but, you know, otherwise, we would all run out of time 
dealing with all of this stuff. Like I probably get 10 alternative theories of cosmology sent to me every week. And I know that the scientists out there get an order of magnitude more than that. Dozens a week, they don't have time. So they have to figure out a way to shorten that process. And that's what they do. So James Webb did not disprove <laughs> that the Big Bang happened. Uh, but it is providing a lot of really interesting insights into the early evolution of the universe. All right, I'm sure you've noticed the planetary name that appeared above my shoulder here. And that is a way for you to vote to tell us which of the questions this week you thought was the best. And the winner last week was for Peter D. Great about bringing samples back from Mars and whether or not it was risky. And a lot of people liked that question and answer. So congratulations, Peter. Congratulations, me. Um, Thank you everyone who voted and please you're going to see those names throughout the rest of the show. Go ahead, vote, just put the name of the planet down in the comments down below and we will gather all those up and we will calculate the winner next week. All right, let's get back to the questions. Sean Gunn, what is the purpose if the rest of the planets in our solar system that has no life? Why are they there taking up space? Hello, please answer. So I guess the question that you're really asking is like, if the rest of the solar system has no life in it, if it's just rocks, you know, regolith, uh, other minerals, various volatiles, water, nitrogen, oxygen, just molecules pulled together by gravity, what is their purpose? Should we feel any reason not to just use the solar system as another resource? And I have no problem with that. Like if we want to go out and crush up asteroids and use them for our giant asteroid factories, that's fine with me. If we want to tear apart the moons of Saturn and turn them into water that we can use for our Titan swimming pools, fine. You know, there's no life out there. But before we get to that process of extracting all those resources, we should just check. And we haven't really checked. Like we have sent a couple of rovers. We have sent a couple of experiments that have provided inconclusive results to tell us whether or not there's life out there across the solar system. And the question of whether or not there is life in the solar system is really important because if we find life on Mars, we'll want to know whether or not we are related to that life. Do we in that life have a common ancestor? Was there some panspermia where life was going back and forth between Earth and Mars or or maybe Venus, we don't know. But if the life on Mars is completely independent from the life on Earth, like it's not even DNA, it has no common ancestor, it evolved completely separately, then that's exciting and also scary, because it means that life could form anywhere in the Milky Way. And it makes it a little weirder that we don't see life anywhere when life formed on Earth and life formed on Mars and life formed under the waters on Europa and life formed on Pluto. And everywhere we look, we see life and it's not related. And yet we don't see life at Alpha Centauri or we don't see life at other places. This is one of the sort of lead in arguments into the great filter. So something wipes out life in our future, and that could include us. But no, if we don't find any life, then I don't think we need to have any kind of moral obligation to use the solar system as a place to extract resources and a place to dump our waste. Like Earth is very special. Earth is the only place that we know of in the entire universe that has life on it that has and we know that it's the only place in the universe that has panda bears and has octopuses and cedar trees and cyanobacteria and tardigrades like there's all of these life forms that are here on Earth. And every day that goes by that we pollute the atmosphere that we pollute the water that we cut down the forest, we are decreasing the number of species on our planet so that we can have a better life. And the inevitable outcome of humanity's process like we are in the process of turning a natural habitat into an human designed planet to some extent. 
And the species that exist here already will be the ones that we drive extinct. And so if we can go and get all of our heavy industry off Earth, if we can send our garbage into space. Okay, I'm throwing it away. Okay, it's flying away. Can you see it on GoPro? And just let Earth be the place for life and let the rest of the solar system be the place for all the other stuff that we want to do. I'm perfectly fine with that. I mean, the only limit that I personally have is that I think there are some aesthetic reasons why we would want to keep some places in the solar system. Like Valles Marineris on Mars, the largest, deepest chasm in the solar system, or uh, some of the places on Titan or some of the geysers on Europa. Like there's a lot of places across the solar system that are pretty cool. And if, you know, we could go a long way just crunching up asteroids, crunching up Kuiper Belt objects, crunching up comets and leaving some of the more beautiful places in the solar system for us to be able to appreciate in the future. And so I think it would behoove us shortly to set up wilderness zones across the solar system that we can then leave untouched while we harvest the rest of the resources, which we will, it's inevitable. And I think for the life, you know, if we do find the life, I got bad news for that life, which is that we're human beings and we're going to do what we do. And what we're going to do is we're going to take your places and take your spaces and probably make you extinct. But it would like that's just inevitable. And I'm not saying that's a good thing. I wish we wouldn't do that. But it's what we tend to do. But I would like to know if we can where that life came from, try to understand it. Is it separate? Are we related? And are we anticipating that we're going to find life anywhere across the Milky Way? If there is no life out there, I actually think it's our duty to spread life away from Earth to go across the solar system to even take life to other star systems that that life is better than non life that having a universe with life in it is a more interesting place. And if there is no other life out there, and we wipe out all life on Earth, it'll make the universe sadder for it not getting a chance to enjoy having life forms all the way across it. And it's in our hands to be able to do this. So what is the purpose of the solar system? Who knows? But we'll find out eventually. Aaron Calhoun, how massive does a star need to turn into a black hole after going supernova? So astronomers think that when the most massive stars die, they turn into various degenerate objects. So black holes, neutron stars, actually the most massive stars when they go supernova, they just detonate entirely and disappear like a big puff of exploded star and there's no remnant at all. But smaller than that, like less than say 50 times the mass of the sun down to eight times the mass of the sun, you're going to get a supernova. Smaller than that, actually. But anyway, the ending result is that if you have an object that has less than 1.4 times the mass of the sun, you get a white dwarf. If it's more than that, up to about 2.2 times the mass of the sun, you get a neutron star. And then beyond that, two plus you get a black hole. But that is like the final result. Like that's the amount of material that's compressed into a small area that turns into a black hole. And so I think the question you're asking is like, how much star will give you that black hole? And it really just depends. Like it depends on how that star dies. How quickly does that star blast off its outer layers into space? How symmetrical is the explosion that happens when the material collapses inward? But it's roughly eight to 10 times the mass of the sun at the bottom end. And so if you have less than eight times the mass of the sun, you will most likely get a neutron star. And if you have more than that, you will most likely get a black hole, but it's a sort of moving target as people are, are figuring out more and more about this. And then one other thing we talked about this last week is this idea of an unnova, that there are certain objects out there that instead of you know, all the material collapsing inward, and then you get the black hole and the material bounces, you actually get the material just coming together, and then just turning into a black hole. And so it might be that that actually smaller objects can turn into black holes as well, depending on how that material comes together. And that's like, that's still a an unsolved mystery in astronomy. 
If you like my answers to your questions, as well as the other things that we do at Universe Today, consider joining our Patreon club. This allows us to keep a minimum ads for everybody. Like, as you can see, there are no ads during the video. As a patron, you'll get an ad-free experience on universetoday.com for life, even if you unsubscribe. You get ad-free videos, early access to interviews, as well as other perks that are exclusive to our Patreon community. And just as an example, is that this week we recorded our first episode of our patron-only podcast and we're calling this the shareholders meeting and really it's just behind the scenes universe today how we choose our stories how we work together as a team uh, how we plan to approach new technologies like chat gpt and more so if you want to sort of hear behind the scenes at universe today learn how we make things uh, i think you'll find that really fascinating so go to patreon.com slash universe today and thanks to claire bear at us Paul D. Disney, John Vincent, Eric Mackey, David Robin, Paul, Verna H. Johnson, Peter G. Heltzen, Steve Gray. Join the club, patreon.com slash universe today. Delvling, what is your favorite sci-fi book which uses futuristic scientific ideas? Well, my favorite sci-fi book tends to be the sci-fi book that I'm reading right now. Uh, and that's like always the case. So when I was reading Andy Weir's books, those were some of my favorite scientific ideas. When I was watching The Expanse or reading The Expanse, those are some of my favorite ideas. Right now, I'm reading Revelation Space series, although I just finished. Um, and those are like my favorite ideas. When I read science fiction, I will park my skepticism as I read the story because it's not doing me any favors because I know too much. Um, and so when I see something that is unrealistic, I, I just let it go. Like, I'm just like, that's cool. Sure. Why not? Um, I'm, I'm not here to critique this. I'm just here to enjoy the story. Um, but the ones that really resonate are the ones where someone has really thought through the implications of this and has proposed ideas that make a ton of sense. And so, for example, as I'm reading the Revelation Space series by Alistair Reynolds, Alistair Reynolds is a physicist. He has his degree in physics. And so the ideas that he proposes in his stories hold to the laws of physics as we understand them and yet are extreme to the max. And I really enjoy that because I will hear this idea for a starship drive or a spacesuit that that can protect the wear or um, an explanation for some kind of alien species. And you're like, Oh, that all works. That's really cool. So I can't give you any specific answer. Like, like my favorite book is the one I'm reading right now. But at the same time, like science fiction isn't about the future. Science fiction is about now. And you're just trying to have a what if scenario, what would Earth be like, if the nations got along and they explored the universe, right? That's Star Trek. But when you go and you watch 1967 Star Trek, it's not the future, it's 1967. But they, they threw in a couple of ideas of what ifs. And like, as we're dealing with the modern acceleration of our technology with computers with the rise of artificial intelligence, like it feels like I have trouble keeping up day to day what's happening all of the changes. And you just know that that this is going to keep on accelerating. And you know, the, the term for this is the technological singularity, it feels like we are now approaching, you know, the on ramp to the technological singularity, and it feels impossible to predict what comes after what's about to happen to us over the next 10 years. Will we develop artificial intelligence, the artificial intelligence will wipe us all out? Will we develop artificial intelligence, get it under control? And uh, have it help us transcend our human bodies and live forever and explore the universe? Will we discover that artificial intelligence is too dangerous, like as in the Dune books, and we won't let anybody develop any kind of thinking computer? It's really hard to predict what the future is going to look like until you've settled this fundamental question, like one of the biggest shifts in humanity that has ever happened. Um, 
and we are now fast forwarding to that. So it's really hard for me to take any science fiction books, futuristic scientific ideas seriously when I sort of hold that against the exponential rise of technology that we're currently undergoing, none of it feels realistic to me. And so I just take it for what it is. It's a story. It's fun. It's entertaining. Are the, are the characters great? Does the, is the technology help enhance the story? That's all I really care about. Jack Ciotto, how large can we make Venusian cloud islands? So one of the interesting things about Venus, like overall, Venus is the worst. It sucks. Like, don't go there. It's a terrible place. But if you go to about 75 kilometers altitude in Venus, then the temperature and pressure are roughly the same as the surface of the Earth, you know, within a few tens of degrees. But more interestingly, just breathable air is a lifting gas on Venus. And so you could go and fill a balloon with air and you can have it float in the high atmosphere of Venus. And you could walk around inside the balloon and you could breathe. And then you could have your little spacesuit on and your breathing apparatus, you could walk out to the deck and you could look down above the Venus cloud tops and enjoy the view. A few downsides. Um, the big one being that there's still sulfuric acid in the atmosphere that's going to be gnawing away at your Venusian cloud island. So that's all sounds great, right? Well, there's like a whole bunch of downsides. So the first downside is that you have no materials. Like here on Earth, we just dig for stuff like uh, rocks and dirt and we grow plants and we have the oceans and we have breathable air and all of these resources that we just take for granted. You're not going to have any of that stuff on Venus. You're not going to have any way that you can easily pull up material from down below. And so everything that you try to send to Venus is going to be something that you uh, were able to send from Earth or some other place in the solar system. So it's not impossible, but it's deeply impractical. And so you're like, how large could we make Venusian cloud islands? We would have a really hard time doing such a thing. And I suspect it's going to be a long time before there's any kind of permanent presence on Venus. Hundreds of years, like after we've really mastered living across the solar system on the moon or Mars on giant orbiting space station colonies, someone's going to take a crack at living in the clouds on Venus. But it's kind of like asking how big of a houseboat could I live on in the middle of the ocean? If every addition to the houseboat that I was able to make could be delivered to me by helicopter from a nearby city. Well, how many houseboats chunks can you afford? That's how many you get, right? Because it's not self sustaining. You're not out there in the middle of the ocean building new houseboats. This isn't the raft. You, you, you have to get these parts shipped in from far away. And so really, it's just like how much you want to spend doing this, we can invest the entire gross domestic product of humanity to build a floating cloud island on Venus. But I don't think it's the best use of our money. There's other places that we should do this first. Mr. Lame Stranged. So I look into a telescope and I see an exoplanet light years away as it was back then. But during that time, a civilization could have risen and sent us a signal. Yes, when we look out into space, we are looking backwards in time. And so when we see a planet that is 100 light years away, we are seeing it as it looked 100 years ago. And so when you think about other civilizations out there in the universe, they point their telescopes at planet Earth. Um, when would they see us at different levels of technology? I mean, you could say, well, we've only been broadcasting radio signals for about 100 years. So in that sphere, like maybe 10,000 stars can see us within 100 light years of us. And maybe for like 200 years, we've been polluting our atmosphere with coal and industrial chemicals. So maybe that's a sphere that's 200 light years away. And then beyond that, like it's really hard to tell that human beings are here because we're not really doing any dramatic changes to our environment. And so we think about if we look out into the universe, we would see the same thing. And so like, one possibility is that all no civilization lasts, like we look out into the universe, and they're all dead. But we should still see them at different phases. So we may see one a 1000 light years away. And they're dead now, but they were thriving when the light reached us. And so that 
sort of argument, like because we can see all of these different slices of time across the galaxy, we would expect to see something, anything, but we don't. Negroni, I heard that the moon actually does rotate slightly as seen from Earth, showing or swaying about two degrees of either side as it orbits the Earth. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, this is really cool. So I'm hoping that Chad will now show a really cool animation of the moon taken from the Earth. And this isn't actually the moon. This is a simulation of the moon that's created by uh, NASA Visualization Center. And they release one of these every year. And it's essentially the entire phases of the moon for the entire year. And so you can see the date rolling up and you can see how the moon is like wobbling back and forth and getting closer and for bigger and smaller. And also you can kind of peek around the corners of the moon. And the technical term for this is called uh, libration. And what's happening is that the moon isn't on the same plane as the Earth. The moon is actually orbiting at a slightly different plane from from the Earth. The Earth or the distance to the moon is changing depending on where it is on its elliptical orbit around. And what that gets you with a combination of these different movements between the rotation of the Earth, the distance to the moon, the angle of where the moon is on its orbit is you can kind of peek around the corners of the moon. And so you would think that we could only see 50% of the moon ever, but actually we can see a little more of it because we get these little peaks around the corner of the moon. So I'd like, I love this video just to see what the moon does. And you can see how the moon just gets like from our perspective, it looks like the moon gets bigger and then smaller and then bigger and then smaller. And what's really happening is that the moon is on this elliptical orbit. We don't notice this throughout the entire lunar month. And so when you get the situation where the moon is at its closest, and it also happens to be a full moon, that's what they call the super moon and the moon is bigger and much brighter. And then when the moon is at the farthest point of its orbit and at the full moon, uh, we call that a mini moon. And so you sort of can oscillate all it. But once a month, the moon is close. And once a month, the moon is far. And sometimes when it's close, it's bright. And sometimes when it's far, it's bright. And you get this libration that allows you to see around the corners. It's such a like, Every year when this video comes out from NASA, I just will gaze slack jawed at it brand new each time. And I love it. Like it's just like they've been doing this for 10 years and I'm so grateful because it's so wonderful. Michael Nichols, why don't we see more CubeSat small telescope projects? Wouldn't even small telescopes outside the Earth atmosphere be useful? Yeah, we're at this strange time in the rise of space exploration of space flight of rockets, where the costs of launching rockets are coming down dramatically. So it's several thousand dollars less per kilogram to launch a spacecraft into orbit. And in many cases, you can now do ride shares where you can have like a small CubeSat tucked into the side of a larger mission, and it can follow on a trajectory into space. We've got this miniaturization of the technology for actually sending spacecraft into space. And a lot of like off the shelf software and hardware at this point will allow you to build a satellite for a fraction of the price. You can now build a satellite for a couple of thousand dollars, tens of thousands of dollars. You can also launch your satellite for roughly the same amount of money. You know, I'm seeing uh, high schools launch satellites, uh, universities launch satellites, private companies are launching these little CubeSats. And you know, you're seeing examples where a single Falcon will send off 60 CubeSats all in one go. So there's a lot of this. One of the biggest problems I would say right now is the ability to communicate your data back to Earth. And so when you build a satellite right now, if you're gonna build like a small CubeSat, you got to sort of think about it. It's like these CubeSats are going around the Earth and they need some way to transmit their data from space back to Earth. And so you've got to set up some kind of ground tracking station to follow your satellite as it comes around in low Earth orbit. And you've got just a few minutes every time it flies overhead of your tracking station to be able to transmit all of its data. And it's going to have a very powerful transmitter on the satellite. You've got a very powerful receiver on the ground. Maybe you've got to set up multiple receivers around the Earth, like, like the infrastructure required for you to be able to transmit data to and from your satellite is 
is a lot. And in many cases, this is the quagmire that new satellite builders get into. They're like, oh, I'd really like to build this tool that would let me observe the earth from space. Yeah, no problem. Like all that tells that technology, it's off the shelf piece of cake. And, and you can launch it for relatively inexpensive. But how are you gonna get that data back down to the ground? Like, it's a constant roadblock. And the solution is coming. Like when you think about what's happening with these satellite networks with Starlink with Kuiper, you're gonna have this opportunity soon, where you launch a satellite, it's got a chip on board that is that allows it to communicate with the Starlink network or the Kuiper network or all of them. And now suddenly, what before was one of the biggest, most complicated hassles to deal with just goes away. You it's just off the shelf, you install it, you pay your service to Starlink every month, and you're able to transmit data back from your satellite at high speed. But there are some CubeSat type telescopes that are in operation right now. We have one from Canada called most, they, they often call it the humble space telescope, and I actually did an interview with a scientist out of Australia who's working on a CubeSat based space telescope that's going to try to find planets orbiting around Alpha Centauri, like its only job is to stare at the twin stars of Alpha Centauri and try to figure out if either of them are being affected by planets. You know, I've seen lots of ideas for space telescopes for small sats. And there's just a little more infrastructure that needs to come together. And then I think we're going to see a revolution in the kinds of missions that small groups like you can imagine a situation where a researcher needs to answer some scientific question, make some observations, and instead of waiting in line uh, for time on some oversubscribed telescope, they're able to build a small telescope and launch it and get, and have it stare only at their target and gather that data. And then when the mission is over, it re enters the Earth's atmosphere and burns up and mission accomplished. So it's coming, it's coming. Major Zipf, if we lived under a sun that gave out light in a different spectrum, would we have eyes that see a different spectrum? Is visible light just visible because we evolved to see it? Yeah, I think that's a great way to describe it that we see visible light because we evolved to see visible light. Now there's lots of good reasons underlying like biological reasons why the spectra of light that we're able to perceive are the ones that we're able to perceive that having evolved to be able to see invisible light to see from red to purple allows us to see like a, the widest range of the kinds of things that we have to interact with on a daily basis. But we know that there are other animals on Earth that have evolved to be able to see into other spectra like we know that snakes can sense infrared, we know that bumblebees can see into the infrared, which lets them see flowers better. We know that mantis shrimps can see many more specific wavelengths of light and perceive different colors than than we do. But if we lived on a world say, a red star, and everything was red all the time, then our idea of what is the visible spectrum would probably be many different shades of red. You know, if we went and looked around, we go like this place all looks red. And they would say no, 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 there's, there's 10 different colors, don't you see? And we'd be like, Nope, we would be effectively colorblind to the kinds of colors that they are able to perceive. So it's just another example that we evolved here on Earth. And we are adapted, there is no place in the universe that is better for us than Earth, and will never be. This is the best place in the universe. For us. Kefak, we hear a lot of theories of to create artificial gravity for spaceships. Why don't we see more experiments on the topic seems like a critical subject to me for space travel. It's critical to you. And it's critical to me like I have all of these burning questions about about what's it going to take for humanity to live out in space. And it really feels like the missing piece to all of the the solution to all our troubles is artificial gravity that we just got to create those gigantic rotating space stations that simulate gravity, and then all of our problems will go away. But they're big, and they're expensive, and they're heavy, and they're technically complicated, and they have risks. And just we're not at that point in our technological scale to justify 
the creation of a space-based rotating artificial gravity system. We're just not there yet. That even though there are health issues for sending astronauts to the International Space Station, that they have to exercise all the time, that they have fluid redistribution problems, especially vision problems, that the solution of a giant rotating space station just is not feasible yet. And, you know, back to the Venus question that we talked about, like, could we build a rotating space station? Absolutely. There have been many really interesting ideas and not just like the big ones, like there's been ones that have been proposed that are very small that the astronauts would lie inside or sit inside or stand inside. And it would be very uncomfortable, but it would at least give them some amount of artificial gravity over the course of like while they sleep, they're in artificial gravity, and then they get up in the morning, and then they're floating around the space station again, and maybe that would do the trick. And I've even seen proposals for ones that could fit inside the fairing of a Falcon 9 rocket. So you'd have this tiny little centrifuge that an astronaut would sit inside and they'd spin around and get this artificial gravity. And then for like two hours a day while they're sending emails home or listening to music or watching TV or something like that. And maybe that will solve the problem of being in space. There was this system called Nautilus X that NASA had proposed to build a couple of years ago. And I think it was like $4 billion as a module to add to the International Space Station. And just NASA has a bunch of priorities. They've got to send people to the moon. They've got to maintain other spacecraft. It's just not easy to dig up $4 billion just so you can prove that you can keep your astronauts healthy in microgravity. It's just we know that humans can survive in weightlessness. And nobody is currently planning to have humans need to survive in space for longer than about a year. And so there's just no priority. At some point when someone decides, okay, now is the time that we're going to have human beings live in space for long periods of time, then we'll see those artificial gravity stations built. And like, I know you want it. And like, I want it too, right? How will we live in space if we don't have these artificial gravity systems? It's like a catch 22. And yet here we are. And right now the plan is maintain the International Space Station until it needs to be deorbited send humans back to the moon and begin creating a permanent base on the moon, begin sending humans to Mars. None of that requires artificial gravity. It would be better with artificial gravity, but none of it requires it. And so that's just where the budgets are. All right, those are all the questions that we had today. Thank you everyone for asking them. Remember, we record this show every Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific time live. So come and join us and don't forget to vote. If you want to stay on top of all the important space news, join my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 60,000 people. I write every word, there are no ads, and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at university.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the University Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at university.com slash podcast, or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to David Gilton and Modso, George, Jeremy Matter, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Arabioff, Andrew M. Gross, and Josh Schultz who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us.